Welcome back to Hinduism. In part two, we're going to look at the Veda, the oldest Hindu scriptures. The early Vedic period is the oldest period in the history of Hinduism. It spans the years from around 1500 to 1100 BCE. This corresponds to the beginnings of the Indo-Aryans in South Asia. The Indo-Aryans began migrating to South Asia from what's now called by archaeologists the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex around 1500 BCE or in the centuries preceding it. They migrated through what's now Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush mountains, probably the Khyber Pass, into the upper headwaters of the Indus or Sindhu River. You can see on the map the spread of the Indo-Aryans, their presumed migration rate, and the approximate areas of South Asia that had Indo-Aryan speaking kingdoms in the early Vedic period. The Indo-Aryans were never politically united, at least not in their early history. They had different kingdoms and what are called tribal republics by modern scholars. These are called republics because they had assemblies where decisions were made collectively, similar to modern republics. However, the assemblies were mostly composed of people from noble families or other prominent families. So it wasn't like they were democratic republics where every person got one vote. In the early Vedic period, there were many villages, but few large settlements. The Indo-Aryans had originally been mainly pastoralists, so mainly subsisting on their herds of cattle and other animals, but they also picked up farming sometime around this period. The Rig Veda, which is the oldest part of the Veda, began to be composed around 1500 BCE. The Veda, as I mentioned, are the oldest Hindu scriptures. They were composed over a series of many centuries, starting around 1500 BCE. And they may also reflect earlier traditions that are even older. The word Veda means seen in Sanskrit. It's a reference to the fact that these texts are regarded as having no human author. They are authored by God or Brahman, the supreme being in Hinduism. Texts that are believed to have a divine author are called Shruti or revealed texts. And the people that they're revealed to are called Rishis or seers. These are people who are gifted, you might say, spiritually, so that they can hear or see these texts that have been left by the Supreme Being kind of in the cosmos. There is a person named Vyasa, you can see in the picture on the right, who is traditionally regarded as the organizer or compiler of the Veda, although he is probably a legendary figure. Central to the Veda and to Vedic religion, thus Hinduism generally, is a ritual known as Yajna, as it was known in the ancient language of the Indo-Aryans. Now it would be pronounced Yajna. The yajna or yagna is a ritual involving fire. It's actually not just one ritual. It's a bunch of rituals that have this use of a fire altar in common. The yajna can also be called a homa. And in the fire ritual, there is a fire kindled in a fire altar constructed temporarily for the occasion. And offerings to the gods are placed into the fire. The fire is believed to take the offerings from the realm of humans to the realm of the gods. And there are also hymns and other chants, formulas, and mantras or sacred words that are uttered during these ceremonies. The hymns, for example, honor the gods. The yajna can only be performed by Brahmins or priests in Hinduism. And the Brahmins are born into this position by their family. And also only the men are allowed to perform the ceremonies. 
So you can see in the picture on the right some modern male Brahmins performing a yajna. And the general pattern of this ceremony is essentially the same today as it was in ancient times, going back thousands of years. Examples of the types of things given as offerings to the gods in the fire include grain, seeds, lentils, milk, incense, ghee, which is clarified butter, and a drink called soma, which is an intoxicating beverage that was believed to have been consumed by the gods as well as people. Ancient yajnas also included sacrifices of animals, including cows and horses. This is not a part of Hinduism today. Specifically with regarding cows, it's regarded as a great sin to even harm a cow, much less kill it. Uh, the horse sacrifice was rare. It was done by a king at some point during their rule to ensure their success and prosperity. Cows were the foundation of the economy of the ancient Indo-Aryans. When they were nomadic, most of their food came from cows and their wealth was measured in cows. And this continued to be the case even after they migrated to South Asia and combined farming along with raising cattle and other livestock. The purpose of the yajna is to ensure this worldly goals, such as health, wealth. It's often said that a god such as Indra will give you many cows, for example, if you pray to him or give him sacrifice. Victory, uh, many sons, uh, and success, worldly success. There is also a belief that performing certain yajnas can guarantee you will have a good afterlife with the other ancestors. So the focus of the early Vedic religion, which is these uh, rituals around the fire, is different from that of many later forms of Vedic religion or Hinduism. This type of ceremony does persist, but there's other types of practices, for example, meditation, praying to images of gods and so on that were introduced in later periods of the history of Hinduism. There are still some Hindus who mainly focus on the yajna and the ceremonies performed by Brahmins. And this type of Hinduism or this approach to Hinduism is called Brahmanism after the name of the priests. So the text of the Veda was transmitted for many centuries through oral means alone, through speech, not through writing. So it's not like someone took up a pen to paper or even a chisel to stone and wrote out the first copy of the Veda. That's the way most texts are composed in modern times. But many ancient scriptures, like other ancient texts, were initially created purely orally and transmitted that way, similar to the way people might learn songs in today's society. So Brahmins traditionally learn and memorize part of the Veda from their guru or teacher. There's a belief that oral transmission from an actual living person can give you insight into the text that you can't get merely from reading it. So there may have been in part a religious purpose for preferring oral transmission as opposed to transmission through reading texts in the early history of the Veda. There's often a sense that a enlightened or spiritually gifted teacher is someone who, in part through their living presence and example, can give you a reliable guide to the meaning of the Veda, as well as them giving their interpretations of the text. Whereas if you're just reading it on your own, you won't get that wisdom, you won't get that insight. The language of the Veda is Sanskrit, the formalized version of Old Indo-Aryan, the language spoken by the Indo-Aryans, the culture that produced the Veda. And Sanskrit can be distinguished from the Prakrits or dialects that were spoken in different parts of the kingdoms of the Aryans and by different groups of people. So Sanskrit is relatively standardized, unlike the Prakrits. It may seem that transmitting a text purely through memorization and oral recitation is a recipe for introducing many errors when people forget the text. And yes, that can happen. But it's interesting that modern scholars have discovered 
some of the techniques for memorization used by Brahmins actually may ensure more faithful transmission of the texts than manuscript transmission. So if you think about other scriptures like the Bible or the Quran, for example, even though the early versions of those were written down, it's not to say that there were never any errors in transmission from written texts. In fact, whenever you copy a text, you generally introduce errors. This can happen even in the modern day with um, software that can read uh, characters off of a text, scan and read, but it also happens with human scribes transcribing texts. And based on the memorization techniques used by modern Brahmins, such as reciting the same text backwards and forwards, reciting in groups, um, skipping every syllable and then going back and repeating it, things like that, it's actually possible they had greater accuracy in transmitting their scriptures than that of other religions that relied on manuscripts. The picture on the right is of a later palm leaf manuscript of the Veda in a script known as Devanagari. Devanagari is a later version of an ancient script used in India called Brahmi that was used by the Brahmins to write the Veda and other texts. But they didn't start writing down the texts until after a thousand years after the early parts of them had been composed. Manuscripts of the Veda as other texts were traditionally made from palm leaves that were basically flattened and compressed together into a type of paper. And you can still see a lot of modern copies of the Veda or other scriptures still in use at temples that have this traditional form. There isn't just one Veda. The Veda is actually a collection of texts. There's four main Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva. And each of those Vedas has four parts or layers of text. The Rig Veda is the oldest part. The oldest hymns of the Rig Veda date back to 1500 BCE. The hymns are basically songs of praise honoring the devas or the gods of Hinduism. The Sama Veda was developed next. It includes some chants sung by a Brahma known as the singing priest. In complex or more elaborate Vedic rituals, there can be multiple Brahmins um, performing the ritual together, and these Brahmins can have different roles in the ritual. The Yajur Veda, which is composed after the Sama, includes shorter formulas for the sacrificing priest. The sacrificing priest is the one actually putting the offerings into the sacred fire. And in part because they're busy with their hands and focusing on the offerings, they have shorter formulas to recite instead of the longer hymns or chants. The Atarva Veda is the youngest of the Veda and it was added with a significant gap between it and the others of several centuries. And it includes mantras or sacred words and phrases that would be uttered by a Brahman or Supreme Priest. The original purpose of these mantras was to correct errors in Vedic ritual. There's a belief in Hinduism that if you perform a yajna or ritual correctly, the gods will respond. That's just in their nature or the nature of the universe. However, if you make even the smallest mistake, such as failing to recite a hymn or chant or formula properly or some other mistake, then that can destroy the efficacy of the ritual. So to restore the integrity of the ritual, uh, the Brahman or Supreme Priest who's overlooking the ceremony can utter a mantra and that will basically heal the wound or the break in the ritual. The Atarva Veda also contains other mantras that could be used essentially as spells or miraculous powers. The four parts of the Vedas correspond to four different layers of the text. The Samhita is the original text of each of the four Vedas. This term means something like proper arrangement. So it would include the original hymns, for example, to the gods in the Rig Veda. The Brahmanas are authored later and each Veda has several Brahmanas. They are commentaries on and interpretations of the Veda. For example, the Brahmanas may contain instructions for how to perform the ritual associated with the Rig Veda, how to construct the altar and so on because the Veda itself just has the actual hymns you would sing during the ritual. 
The Brahmanas sometimes contain other information as well, such as early systems of astronomy or geometry. The Aranyakas and the Upanishads are different. They're actually considered part of the Veda, but they're more removed from the original text. The word Aranyaka means a forest treatise. It's a reference to the fact that at some point in the early history of Hinduism, sometime before the uh, 500s BCE, there were groups of ascetics or renunciates, people who had renounced all their worldly attachments, who went to live in forests or wilderness areas, essentially to find God or unify with the Supreme Being. And some of them stayed within the realm of Hinduism and they wrote the Aranyakas. This gave a secret or hidden layer of meaning of the original Veda, which they claimed connected to their new philosophy or their new spirituality. The Aranyakas are not quite as famous as the Upanishads. The Upanishads are the youngest part of the Veda, and they're basically just a continuation of the Aranyakas. Um, the oldest Upanishad is actually called the Brihad Aranyaka. So its original title had Aranyaka in it. The word Upanishad means a connection. And one way of interpreting this is a secret or hidden connection between Vedic rituals and some deeper spiritual truth. A famous example of this is in the beginning of the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, where the Vedic sacrifice of a horse to ensure the success of a king is radically reinterpreted. It's interpreted not as a literal killing of a horse and offering it to the gods, but as a symbol of a wise person or a renunciate's sacrifice of all of their attachments to the world for the sake of attaining enlightenment or spiritual union with the Supreme Being, who's called Brahman in Hinduism. And the Upanishads proceed in this fashion to present deeper layers of meaning from the original Veda. We're going to cover the Upanishads in the next video in more detail. The god Indra is one of the main gods or devas of the Veda. He's regarded as the king of the gods and thus was the most or one of the most important gods in early Vedic religion. Indra is still a part of Hinduism, but the religion has evolved greatly since ancient times. If you date it back to 1500 BCE, that's over 3,500 years of development. So perhaps it's not surprising that some things have changed, like Indra no longer being regarded as the prominent or the most important god. He is still regarded as the king of the devas, but there are other gods who are associated with the supreme being, Brahman. We'll talk more about that in later videos. He's a god of thunder, similar to the Greek god Zeus, the Norse god Thor, the Roman god Jupiter. The Greeks, the Romans, the Germans, these are all Indo-European peoples like the Indo-Aryans. And that can explain many of the similarities that you can find between their religions. You can see in one of the hands, one of the right hands of Indra in the image on the slide, he's holding um, what's called a Vajra. The Vajra is a symbolic thunderbolt that's regarded as the weapon of Indra. One of the stories told about Indra in the Veda is that he was the slayer of an evil being known as Ritra. Ritra was an embodiment or personification of drought and he was often depicted as a serpent or dragon. And when Indra killed Vritra, he basically brought rain to the world and made the world fertile. So you can see sometimes these myths, they reflect on cycles of nature. Even though we're talking about the religion based on the Veda, the image on the right um, is something that was created later in the history of Hinduism, probably even a couple thousand years after the earliest parts of the Veda do we get this type of imagery associated with Indra. The use of ex uh, elaborate imagery to represent gods and goddesses in Hinduism uh, probably started in the first millennium CE or AD. And there are aspects of this imagery that do go back to the early Veda, like the Vajra that I mentioned. 
But Indra, for example, is not um, described as riding a white elephant or as having four arms in the early Veda. So some of this iconography was created later during a period known as devotional Hinduism or Bhakti. Another important god of the Veda is called Varuna or Mitra. He's regarded as an upholder of the moral law or Dharma and of oaths, contracts, promises, and covenants. So for example, he may punish you if you break your oath that you made with someone. So Varuna is regarded as a protector of this kind of cosmic moral order. It's an important concept in Veda that's titled Rita. And he's also connected to the notion of satya or truth. So being true to your word. Satya is one of the main moral values of the Veda uh, and of early Vedic religion and culture. So it's a common theme in ancient Hindu stories, for example, that a king should never break their word. That would be a great dishonor. Like that's almost worse than anything else they could suffer. And Dharma is a word that can mean moral law. And like the Rita, it's supposed to be something that prevails in the universe, although sometimes the gods need to step in to actively defend it or restore it. Varuna was later regarded as a god of the ocean. Apparently, what could happen with some of the gods named in the Veda is that they would later be associated with other gods. And so that's one of the ways they could take on these other attributes. The iconography of Varuna you see on the right also includes him riding a crocodile. This was not something mentioned in the early Veda. So the gods in Hinduism often ride a specific type of mount called a Vamana. So Indra, for example, is depicted riding a white elephant. Varuna is riding the crocodile and so on. Agni is the name that literally means fire. It was used to refer to the sacred fire in the Yajna or Vedic ritual. Eventually though, Agni became regarded as a god in his own right, and many of the hymns of the Rig Veda are directed to Agni. So the role of the fire in the sacrifice is to be a kind of intermediary, bringing the offering from the Brahman to the god. So Agni is kind of like a middleman or intermediary. You can see him depicted on the right with a kind of crown of flames. By the way, the word Agni is related to the English words ignite and igneous. And you can see a lot of parallels between Sanskrit, the main language of Hinduism, and English and other Indo-European languages because they do descend from a common ancestor. Another important god in the early Veda is called Soma. Soma is associated with the moon god called Chandra, which just means moon. The original meaning of Soma is some sort of intoxicating drink that was used in Vedic rituals. It could be consumed by the Brahmins. It could be offered into the fire. It was believed to be the favored god drink of the gods. We don't know exactly what Soma consisted in, um, it was some plant or collection of plants. Uh, one proposal of some modern scholars is a phaedra, which was a stimulant known to grow in the homeland of the Indo-Aryans um, in Central Asia or further north of South Asia, but something that would be rare in South Asia itself. So after the Indo-Aryans migrated into South Asia, they ceased to have access to Soma. It became rare or unavailable, and so many substitutes are written for it into the Veda. However, it sort of retained this idea of a kind of mythic or mystic drink of the gods and priests. It's also possible that Soma was a kind of cocktail composed of multiple substances, possibly such things as cannabis and um, poppy juice, as well as um, ephedra. Yama is the Vedic god of death, judgment, and justice because he's the judge of the dead. He lives in an underworld realm called Patala or Yama Loka, which means world of Yama. He's not an evil being, but rather a neutral judge of people, giving them an afterlife based on how they acted in their life. 
the original Hindu view of the afterlife, which you can see in the Veda, is relatively simpler than what it evolved into. So there was one underworld or land of the dead that all people went to, even though there could be different variations of what it was like for you based on your actions. And this is similar to the ancient Greek religion, which postulated an underworld realm ruled by the god Hades. And Hades was not an evil god, but rather a kind of neutral ruler of the dead under the earth. In later Hinduism, there were more elaborate cosmologies and theories of reincarnation, where you could be reborn into many different bodies and many different worlds or levels of being. That's not an idea we see in the early Veda. There is a realm where the gods live, there's a realm where the people live when they're alive, and there's an underworld realm where people go after they die. And that's about it. Another god mentioned in the Veda is called Rudra. He's a god of wind and storms. He's sometimes called the roarer um, because it's believed he makes a roaring sound like the wind. This is not one of the main gods of the Veda. That would be gods like Indra, Agni, and Soma, for example. But he's important because he later became associated with the god called Shiva. Shiva is one of the most important gods in Hinduism today. Among other things, he's a god of meditation and yogis, or people who practice a spiritual discipline for the sake of salvation. Shiva was not a god mentioned in the Veda, and the fact that he's associated with Rudra may show a general pattern in Hinduism, that some gods that were not originally part of Vedic religion become incorporated into it as a result of being equated or associated with a god named in the Veda. This is a modern image of Rudra on the right. It does show attributes of Shiva, such as the animal skins and the trident. These are not things associated with the god Rudra in the Veda. Another Vedic god that later arose in prominence is Vishnu. Alongside Shiva, he's one of the most important gods in Hinduism today. One of the epithets or titles given to Vishnu is the all-pervading one because he's regarded as pervading the entire universe. He's also associated with gods or incarnations, Rama and Krishna, as well as others. There's a story from a later text after the Veda about Vishnu that illustrates the cosmology or view of the universe present in the early Veda, even though it comes from a later period. This story begins with an ancient war between the gods and demons called Asuras. The Asuras actually won, they defeated the gods and were able to take over the world. The ruler of the Asuras was known as Bali, or Mahabali, which means Great Bali. Vishnu saw the state of affairs and hatched a plan to win back the world for the gods. He decided to incarnate, that is take on a human body, uh, in the form of a Brahmin or priest who was a dwarf, very short in stature and the name of this Brahmin was Vamana. Vamana went to seek an audience with King Bali. There was a custom in ancient India that kings or other rulers would give an audience, uh, which included talking to, giving hospitality to, and a gift to Brahmins. In exchange, the Brahmin might perform a ritual which would give them blessings or might give them a piece of advice or wisdom. Um, and as his gift, Vamana asked for as much land as he could cross in three steps. The implication from the context of the story is that he was actually going to use this land for his sacred ritual on behalf of the king. So there are two parts to Vishnu's strategy. One, he's incarnating as a Brahmin. A Brahmin is a priest, someone who could expect to be received and given attention by the king. Two, he's a dwarf, so he's not going to be able to cross a large amount of land in only three steps. So it's going to make the king more likely to grant his request. Bali's advisors actually figured out what was going on, but he foolishly ignored them and agreed to give the dwarf Raman as much land as he could cross in three steps. It was at this point that Vishnu manifested himself as the cosmic divine being he actually was. So he starts out in the highest heaven, what we would call outer space, and his first step takes him all the way to the sky or lower atmosphere. 
His second step takes him from the sky all the way across the earth, and he still has one step left. So the third step he places on the head of Mahabali to show that he, Vishnu, is master of Bali and the other demons, and that's how he won back the universe for the gods. The story of the three steps of Vishnu illustrates what's called the Trilokia, or three worlds cosmology, present in the Veda. This divides up the universe into three main parts. Heaven, which is called Svarga, sky, which is the middle world, and earth. Heaven essentially corresponds to what we would call space today. It includes heavenly bodies like the sun, moon, stars, and planets. This is believed to be where the gods or devas live, as well as other divine beings. The word sky is somewhat misleading, perhaps. It includes the atmosphere, the air, everything from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface of the earth. So it's actually the middle world where humans and other animals live. And then the earth refers to everything beneath the surface of the, the earth. This includes Patala, or the underworld, and the land of the dead ruled by Yama. So this is actually not the cosmology that most Hindus have today. Most Hindus believe more elaborate cosmologies that are somewhat modifications of this. One of the main changes is adding multiple heavens and multiple underworlds. And these types of cosmologies with more worlds can be found in later sacred scriptures known as Dharma Shastras and Puranas. We'll talk about those in later videos. There are also many devis or goddesses in the Veda. One of the most important is Usha's goddess of the dawn. She's actually the most frequently named goddess in the Rig Veda. She's similar to Aurora, the ancient Roman goddess of the dawn. There are three other goddesses in the Veda that became especially important in later Hinduism. Sarasvati, Lakshmi, and Uma, also known as Parvati. Sarasvati is the goddess of speech, song, music, and learning. She's also associated with a river that is believed to have dried up in ancient times. This may have actually been the river that the Indus Valley civilization was built on. This is the oldest civilization from India that we mentioned in the first video. The origins of Hinduism. And um, the fact that that river had dried up, leading to the decline of the Indus Valley civilization, uh, means that it may have still, knowledge of that river may have persisted in North India for many centuries, thus giving rise to the legend of Saraswati. But we don't know that for sure. Saraswati is a popular goddess. She's regarded as the patron, for example, of students, scholars, and musicians. She's also the wife of the creator god Brahma. Many gods in Hinduism have wives or consorts. We'll talk more about that in a later video. The two other goddesses rose in prominence in part because they were associated with the gods Vishnu and Shiva, respectively. Lakshmi is the wife or consort of Vishnu. Uma is the wife or consort of Shiva. Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth and prosperity. And Uma or Parvati is the goddess of love and fertility. And you can see a picture of Saraswati and her legendary river on the right. A very important concept in the Veda is Dharma, and this is a word that has many meanings, both in the Veda and in later Hinduism. The basic meaning is something like law, a moral law that governs the cosmos, or some other pattern or regularity you can observe in the universe. It's also connected to the idea of duty. Humans have a duty to follow the moral law. It can also mean things that are even more abstract, such as truth what is fundamentally real about the universe, or a teaching about that truth. Dharma is sometimes used as a word for religion in India. That's why another word for Hinduism is Sanatana Dharma, or eternal Dharma. So the early Veda has ideas about following the Dharma that are somewhat different from later Hinduism. Keep in mind that later Hindus do acknowledge the authority of the Veda, so it's more like they kept these ideas and added more on them. But following the Dharma in the original Veda means following moral rules like Satya, always speaking truly. Honoring the Devas through sacrifices, singing hymns, and other rituals mentioned in the Veda. And there's also a concept of Varna Dharma, which is Dharma based on your Varna or caste that you're born into. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
Benefits of following the Dharma in the early Veda include mainly blessings, abundance, success, things like many sons and cattle are mentioned. These are worldly goals, things that you can achieve during this lifetime. There's also a belief that the rituals of the Veda will give you a good afterlife. And one example of a ritual you have to do is you have to cremate your body in the special ceremony prescribed in the Veda in order to be sent to the afterlife with the virtuous ancestors. The picture on the right just illustrates a modern image of different ways of following Dharma in Hinduism. For example, you can see in the top center performing a yajna or sacrifice, still a part of Hinduism. On the right is studying the Veda. On the bottom is basically the relations of respect between husband, wife, and other family members. And on the lower left is giving offerings to images and paying respects. That lower left image is something that was not part of the early Veda, so far as we know. It was added later in the history of Hinduism in the first millennium CE or AD. So let's talk a bit about the Varnas or the castes. The word Varna does not actually appear in the Rig Veda, but the Varnas themselves are mentioned in the Purusha Sukta. Purusha is a word that means person. It's often used to refer to a cosmic creator in the Rig Veda. So we have some early hymns from the Rig Veda that give the oldest Hindu creation stories. There isn't one Hindu creation story, there are several. The ones involving Purusha, specifically the Purusha Sukta, involve him dividing the parts of his body into different parts of the universe. And that's connected to the story of the four Varnas. So Purusha is regarded as a kind of supreme being, later regarded as identical to Brahman or the supreme being in Hinduism. From his mouth or head comes the Brahmins or priests. From his arms come the Kshatriyas or warriors. From his legs come the Vaishyas or farmers and merchants, and from the bottoms of his feet come the Shudras, who are laborers and servants. Each of these Varnas traditionally played a different role in Indian society. So the Brahmins are the students of the Veda. They're the only ones who have the authority to interpret the Veda and to perform its rituals. Specifically, only male Brahmins can perform yajnas or sacrifices. The Kshatriyas are the nobility they hold the political power. They're also mainly the warriors because the rulers of the different kingdoms and territories are the ones who can afford to arm and equip themselves for battle and who have an incentive to fight to defend their land. So they're kind of similar to the knights of medieval Europe in that respect. The Vaishya are the commoners, people like farmers and merchants who are free people. They are not slaves or servants. The Shudra are not slaves per se, but their main occupation is to serve the other Varnas. So modern Hindus still regard themselves as members of one of these four Varnas based on what family they're born into. Families are associated with even narrower castes called Juddies. We'll talk about those in a later video. But each of the Juddies is associated with the Varna. So the system is still alive and well today, even though it doesn't operate like it did in ancient times. Um, even though Brahmins, for example, are the only ones allowed to become priests, it's not the case that all Brahmins grow up studying the Veda extensively and only a minority of Brahmins actually function as priests in the society. However, this still does have an important influence on modern Hindu and Indian society. The top three Varnas are known as Davidya, which means twice born. So the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas. These are the ones allowed to undergo the Upanayana, a special initiation ceremony described in the Veda. This involves learning and reciting um, part of the Veda, like a Vedic hymn and, or prayer. And after you perform this ceremony, essentially you become a man, an adult male, and are ready to get married and lead a household um, should you wish. And the head of the household is responsible for, for performing certain basic uh, Vedic ceremonies. Um, so there are some Vedic ceremonies outside of the purview of Brahmins because people of any caste, the Kshatriyas and Vaishyas as well, could perform them. However, the Shudras are not a Davidya Varna. They're not allowed to do the Upanayana ceremony. 
So we don't know exactly the history of this social structure. It's possible that the Shudras were mainly descended from non-Indo-Aryans, so they were not originally fully incorporated into the religion. There have been some modern genetic studies which show different proportions of uh, Eurasian, West Eurasian ancestry in different modern Varnas. So the Brahmins are the ones that have the highest percentage of um, ancestry uh, from what's now Central Asia or Western Eurasia. So outside of the original uh, South Asian population. This is somewhat speculative. We don't know exactly how this fits into the history of the Varnas, but it's possible that the Shudras were originally not a part of the Varna system, that there were three classes and then they were added on to it. Nevertheless, modern Hindus of all the Varnas fully participate in Hinduism. And in fact, the Upanayana ceremony is not that commonly performed anymore, mainly by some Brahmin families. You can see the pictures on the right, a modern depiction of the Varnas. This is actually from a uh, Hare Krishna or ISKCON publication. You can see, um, Krishna has an icon in the center of this, and that's symbolizing the idea that Krishna is, is the supreme god in this Hindu sect, and he's regarded as the source and creator ultimately of the Varnas. But apart from that image, um, the rest of the images do a decent job showing you what members of the four Varnas uh, would look like in traditional Indian society. 